we have been writing and talking about the Wells Fargo scandal of the fraudulently opened accounts, uh, some two million plus of them, and about the testimony of Wells Fargo CEO John Stumpf before the Senate Banking Committee this week. Now here to talk about that with us in greater detail is William K. Black. Bill Black is the editor-in-chief and contributor to New Economic Perspectives, a website. He's an associate professor of law and economics at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He was also the uh, chief regulator involved in the tracking down of uh, criminality in the savings and loan scandal uh, in of the 1980s, where there were a number of convictions, unlike the scandals leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. And he joins us now. Bill, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you. And thanks for sitting through that long e- introduction. But, uh, you know, you were the first guy I thought of when this uh, Wells Fargo uh, story broke. We keep hearing uh, we keep hearing Wells Fargo's defenders say that well, there wasn't much material damage. Uh, we're really just talking about the inconvenience. It, it wasn't. It was just a lot. A bunch of rogue uh, employees, some five thousand of them, and counting. Uh, w- let's start with this. What's your overall thought of this story and this scandal? So first, um, people are not talking about the larger scandal. They're only talking about folks who were so successfully extorted that they allegedly um, made up these accounts. I think, in fact, we'll find that many of the people fired were actually the better people. Hmm. Uh, And we know that from the CFO's testimony, who said, no, 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 the people who did this were the ones... Um, who were not successful at cross-selling. They were the weak employees. And, of course, those are precisely the folks they were firing, people who refused to meet their quotas, refused to cheat people. Um, So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect is that the far broader scandal is not this mere 2 million felonies, (laughs) but uh, the fact that they sold tens of millions of product to people who did say yes, um, who uh, were buying things that were bad for them. Um, And that scandal is very similar to the United Kingdom scandal, where most of the things people purchased, uh, they agreed to purchase them. It's just that they were terrible product, uh, right? And and we now we're so focused on the most blatant part, the actual Uh, creation of phony accounts without any permission, that they're getting a complete pass on the bigger scandal, which is the biggest thing they do, right? It's not like cross-selling is an incidental thing uh, to Wells Fargo. It is their defining characteristic, and they do it vastly more than any other major bank. They brag about it all the time. It produced their revenue. It produced these, as uh, Senator Warren's question brought out, over $200 million rise in stock price. Uh, that's just for the CEO, right, uh, leading this, uh, um, Mr. Stumpf. Um, and by the way, Stumpf in German means dull or obtuse. And you could see from his answers to the questions, um, blaming it all on the little people that he was extorting, uh, that he lives down to that uh, meaning of he really is obtuse about uh, all these things. I was also struck, just just, uh, perhaps parenthetically, I was also struck by the posture that uh, that Mr. Stumpf or Stumpf took in his testimony, which was almost, which was that of the chief executive as innocent bystander, that he just had, uh, he couldn't possibly pre- prevent these thousands of employees from running on a rampage, nor could he possibly have known that the uh, executive responsible for them, who reported to him directly, was uh, was encouraging this. Um, nor could he even take a position on whether that executive's uh, 
uh, uh, $100 million uh, benefit package should be clawed back because really that there's a human resource committee that de decides that. I had the image listening to him that the CEO must be very low in the pecking order of the Wells Fargo organization. Right. So this uh, has two key points. Uh, the first one, uh, he is the latest in a long line of CEOs who have said exactly the same type of thing um, at the massive frauds that we've now found are at the core, not the periphery, the core of every one of the largest banks in America and in Europe. And that is Oh, man, these things are too big to manage. I couldn't possibly know what's going on. Well, if they're too big to manage, they're not efficient, and they should be broken up. Now, they should be broken up for other reasons as well. They're dangerous to the world, um, and they create crony capitalism. But even by their own testimony, these things can't be managed, and they need to be ended. But you're right about the second point. Whenever it comes time for uh, doling out bonuses, Oh, man, the CEO is powerful. It sets everything and, is, you know, should get literally hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation unless, you know, something goes wrong, in which case it's never the CEO's problem. And if it's the CEO's top lieutenants, he refuses to do anything about them. And there's a third element of all of this, and that is why we get these stupid settlements out of the uh, – United States government and its federal agencies that are so utterly useless and lead to these serial abuses, right? You can see there's been no deterrence that bank after bank, year after year, major bank after major bank, year after year, comes up with still newer felonies. And again, we're talking about 2 million felonies plus tens of millions of inappropriate sales uh, that should be treated uh, as a, a scandal uh, in all of this. But None of it matters because they can simply use the shareholder money to pay the yeah sure to pay the and we're talking with Professor William K. Black to jail in the senior ranks little people might but uh, in the senior ranks none of these folks go to prison so there's absolutely no deterrence so here's the incentive structure now I've negotiated these deals so you know for the federal government one the CEO's priorities are in order I don't go to prison. I don't lose my job. I don't have to pay back any of the fraud proceeds that I got, the $200 million in Stump's case. And fourth, I don't throw any of my other senior executives to the wolves in terms of criminal liability, because if I did, they might flip on me mm -hmm. and give testimony to the federal government, and we might actually have prosecutions. So it's uh, you know second verse same as the first right uh and and i uh, bill uh, uh, in terms of the failure of these federal uh, these uh fraud settlement deals to uh have teeth and to prevent further acts um I want to read to you, uh, Wells Fargo was fined $1.2 billion earlier this year for foreclosure fraud. Um, and the Justice Department press release at the time, in describing Wells Fargo's behavior, said uh, Wells Fargo elected to hire temporary staff to churn out and approve an ever-increasing quality quantity rather of FHA loans. At the same time, Wells Fargo's management applied pressure on its underwriters to approve more and more loans. The bank also imposed short turnaround times. In other words, uh, forcing lower level employees to bend or break the rules in order to churn out unrealistically high levels of volume appears to be Wells Fargo's M.O., does it not? Well, not just Wells Fargo. You are Correct. FHA has now brought um, roughly 10 of these actions against major banks, and the story is always the same. And it was the story of the broader financial crisis, and it was the story of the savings and loan debacle uh, as well. So this is the normal strategy. And again, if you don't send people to prison, uh, they're going to keep on doing it, and then they're going to blame the low-level people and throw them under the bus 
And the federal government has been complicit in allowing this story, uh, this complete BS story, and these, and never bringing these cases to trial. Because if you brought out the facts of what Wells Fargo was doing in public day after day in a six-week trial, you would have transformed how the public responded to these crises. Let me tell you something else. I have you know, two other hats that, that even in your long introduction were covered. I have a doctorate in criminology, and uh, I'm a co-founder of Bank Whistleblowers United. Well, it turns out, um, and we only know this because of this hearing, that these cases were made possible not by some brave you know, federal agencies, um, but by whistleblowers. And so what we learned is that uh, the CFPB, um, this is the uh, uh, new um, organ created as a result of Dodd-Frank, uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, um, its director testified that they began their investigation because whistleblowers came to them. Now, by the way, that's also insane because this story was broken uh, by Scott Record in the uh, L.A. Times in 2013. I know. I three remember. years ago. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, and and the second thing is uh, they read uh, in the hearing yesterday that it it turns out that a employee had blown the whistle to stump in writing in 2011, and he claimed he had never even heard about it through 2013 and said, well, he had no memory of that employee. And the senator said, maybe because you fired her. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. And and, and let's <laughs> so let's let's change gears here for a second, William K. Black, and talk about, you know, you mentioned that the government has kind of collaborated it with or at least enabled this kind of behavior. I would argue that the financial media and the media in general has done so as well. One of the things that you hear about uh, these cases is, that, well, there's really nothing prosecutable, for example, with. Wells Fargo, okay, you had, maybe they pressured their employees a little, maybe they were a little aggressive in their sales culture, but, and maybe these employees uh, uh, did uh, open these phony accounts, but nobody was real. Uh, we could talk about the harms done. Nobody was really hurt, but it, it's not illegal per se. It's just, it's just not very nice. Are, are, are there specific statutes under which, uh, let's say, senior executives at Wells Fargo could be prosecuted for something like this? Yes, if, if they were on notice uh, of it or if they simply um, it deliberately prevented themselves from learning about it. There's a doctrine in the law that allows you to, to have felony liability for all of those things. As I said, according to Wells Fargo itself, uh, the, the, their folks committed two million felonies. And remember, this is just their version of it. Well, right? tell me, well, yeah, yeah. an independent investigation is likely to find far broader frauds. Plus, as I said, the non-fraud stuff. Well, what, so, what's yes, the you felony? Could prosecute. Uh, on what would the charge be? What would the charges be for uh, senior executives? Potentially, obviously, we can't convict them. But what would theoretically the charges be? What would the charges be? Maybe at a lower level. What what laws did they break? Fraud, false statements to federal regulators, uh, and uh, wire um, and mail fraud, um, and identity theft in a number of cases, it appears. And would a CEO uh, be liable under Sarbanes-Oxley if it turned out that he knew something like this was taking place that could cause uh, material uh, harm to the company reputationally or otherwise and failed to disclose that to investors? With, even without Sarbanes-Oxley, they could be held liable for that. But you're right that they, Sarbanes-Oxley added provisions designed to make it easier to go after the CEOs who did exactly what you heard here, which is, you know, the clink event, I know nothing uh, type of thing. I, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just the guy that's sort of in this big office. How could I possibly know anything? Um, but yes, you can prosecute, but you have to do serious investigation. And this is how bad it is. So first, this supposed investigation that found the two million, this was not done by the federal government. 
they allowed Wells Fargo to hire a firm to investigate it, which reports to Wells Fargo. Was that Price now, Waterhouse? Know, Bill, was that Price Waterhouse uh, Cooper? Cooper's yes. Because Price Waterhouse Cooper is just just uh, parenthetically was the uh, accounting firm for both AIG and Goldman Sachs when and didn't seem to notice anything amiss on either side of it when when all the uh, Michigas was going on in the run up to the uh, financial crisis over at AIG. So uh, I'm not sure they they are the bulldogs I would want investigating digging up everything I want to know on my case. Unless well, I was first, Wells Fargo. You're absolutely right about that. And But second, there's a broader problem. If the firm you know, that's supposedly being investigated hires them, then it always comes back the same. Oh, there were these bad things out in some regional office. And uh, we found no evidence that the, the most senior people uh, had anything to do with this. Well, how did we find that? We asked them. Did you, were you responsible for this? And they said no. And they can't, they don't have subpoena authority. They don't conduct depositions. They're, it's not a real investigation. The federal government is supposed to be doing the investigations. But even worse, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, in their um, complaint, A, they got zero admissions, none. This is also true of the CFPB. So in terms of accountability, you have to admit this is what we did. This is what is wrong. This, these are the laws that were violated, to come back to your earlier question. That's what you're supposed to do uh, in, for example, under the Yates Memorandum at the Department of Justice, where she said these stupid settlements with no admissions are uh, largely useless, right? Now, that applies to the Justice Department, but the logic applies to these federal agencies. So they got zero admissions. They didn't do their own investigation of any real investigation, even though the whistleblowers pointed the way. Did you hear them ever thank the whistleblowers? No, I didn't. Did you hear and them I... ever call on whistleblowers to come forward? No, absolutely not. And Probably. I think... Um, absolutely um... not. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but uh, I, I would love to explore this with you more at, at some point, hopefully soon. But a fascinating case and uh, uh, so much more that can be said and done and pro investigated in, in, a, in a situation like this. So as always, William K. Black, professor of law and economics uh, at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.